Hello, it's Ted Ritzer, the host of the Greening Government Webinar Speaker Series. Uh, this series is a collaboration between my department, Alberta Environment and Parks, and also the Alberta Climate Change Action Centre, as well as the Municipal Climate Change Action Centre as well. And uh, we are very fortunate in the kind of uh, presentations that we are uh, getting within this series. And uh, the format is we'll have uh, up to a maximum of 40 minutes presentation, as followed by tw up to a maximum of 20 minutes uh, Q&A. Today, we're very fortunate to be joined by Alastair Davies with uh, the uh, Zoological Society of London. And uh, he's got some fascinating stories about the use of open source and open technology uh, for conservation. So with that said, Alistair, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Ted. And a, a pleasure to be here today. Um, thrilled to actually take you on a journey as to how I came to, to be an open conservation technologist, as I, as I state today. So I'm Alistair Davis. Um, I'm based in London. I've spent 10 years at the Zoological Society of London. Uh, that's essentially uh, the conservation program arm of London Zoo. And I describe myself as an engineer, but I'm also a Shuttleworth Foundation fellow. And I'll go through the journey of how I got to that fellowship and how that connects to the open conservation technology world that I'm going to describe today. So to begin my uh, presentation, I'd like to actually take a look at what conservation technology is. And this is quite a good thing to define because often when you stand up on a stage and talk about conservation technology in general, some people perceive that as, is that, for example, um, purely clean energy? Is it just solar energy? Is it, for example, um, recycling and technologies that help us um, live a sustainable livelihood? And to me, as, a, as a, an engineer who works in conservation technology at a wildlife organization and have, have kind of grown into that over the last 10 years, to me, conservation technology is a technological device, and you can see in the screenshot here, um, there's a camera trap uh, underneath the text there. It's a device that can help you answer a conservation question in the field, and often it's a challenging question. So the technologies I work with may be miniaturized tags to track animals, they may be covert solutions to photograph poaching events, or there may even be software-based elements, so apps and um, software packages to help conservationists and protected land managers do their job better in the field. And you can see on the screen here, this is something called Instant Detect. And this is one of the big projects I've worked on, and it's a multi-sensor system for protected um, areas. And it's designed to act both as a wildlife monitoring tool and as an anti-poaching tool. You can see the actual camera that you saw a moment ago in this, uh, photograph as being camouflaged. It's made to look like an insect nest. You can actually see the actual aperture of where the camera is and the little um, kind of like uh, PCB pole there you see is actually protecting what's called the PIR, so the passive infrared sensor, and that's what detects the heat of an animal or a person walking past. And these were designed to offer um, wildlife law enforcers and rangers an opportunity to capture photographs of illegal events in real time and send them back over a satellite connection to a central hub where you can make an assessment, you can work with protected land area managers to, to look at where you may have a human wildlife conflict. And it's one of the, the key tools I've been working on. I'm gonna go through why I think open conservation technology is so fundamental to the future of this tool. So I've also worked on animal tags. Here you can see a device called a Mataki. And this device again is open at its core it was developed by a chap called Robin Freeman, uh, who at the time worked with Microsoft Research, and he brought that into the, the Zoological Society of London. And it's been used on a number of species, from seabirds to um, a number of tigers, and even on uh, elephants. And essentially, it's an aggregator. So it's a little open tool that detects the um, GPS location. So it's got a GPS chip on there, as you can see of the species you're tagging. It has a little accelerometer, but it can also share the data between itself. So say, for example, you're tagging a flock of uh, pigeons and only one of the pigeons returns to your nest. So let's just say a racing pigeon. 
if during its flight it came into close proximity with another pigeon with a, with a tag, it will share the data, which means that you can actually get really good data sets from just uh, actually getting a physical device off one of the species you tagged. You don't have to actually get every single device back. It's still a wireless tool, uses uh, the 868 megahertz frequency band. So that's a free ISM band here in Europe. And of course, there's alternatives over in the States and Canada. And it was a low cost tool. It was developed for 99 pounds. Um, and it was devised for conservation technologists to either use independently or potentially customize. And I'll go into what the future is for this tool as well as I go through my journey into open source tech. And this is kind of like my, uh, uh, my shining kind of uh, example of what you can do with open source technology. And this has been dubbed the pit stop tag. It's a green sea turtle tag. You can see that in the photo there, it's, it's milled into an acrylic case using open source machines. Um, the whole process was to design a cheap and affordable tag that would get you good spatial data. And this data then could be used to dramatically um, accelerate our understanding of marine protected areas. If you don't go down the open route and you want to buy a commercial uh, sea turtle tag with a good GPS uh, fast lock acquisition system, you're looking at two to three thousand dollars to get the one tag. The tag in the photo is three hundred dollars. And the, the reason we could do that is because we used completely open source practices, open source designs, on, the, on demand electri electrical printing. And to me, this is kind of a shining example of what you can do if you rethink your, um, your practice and you re rethink how can we sense the world in a better way? How can we use technologies that are shareable and accessible, invite the community to get involved, um, share that expertise, which is always fundamentally expensive. To get an engineer at the top of their game to, um, to work on your uh, initiative or your solution is fundamentally expensive. So how can we share resources and share our, um, our designs and our open source hardware and software packages to better what we want to actually do, achieve um, conservation success in the field? And of course, a few special um, sidelines. This is a microbial fuel cell. Essentially, it generates power from plants. So the bacterial process, if you were to put soil into this, um, into this hole you can see in the photo, uh, the bacterial process is captured by uh, a process that was devised in Cambridge, Cambridge University, by a chap called Paolo Bombelli. And I'm looking at how we can actually generate a few milliamps of power to charge Internet of Things sensors in the field in indefinitely. So imagine the ability to deploy a device that simply wakes up and takes a measurement. So for climate change or any environmental monitoring, it'll be fantastic because you can uh, source power over a, a long period of time, wake up and take an environmental measurement, and then go back to a deep sleep. But of course, to do that, you even need solar or a battery. Even with the advent of very low powered sensors, it's still not um, accessible into the five or 10 year mark without having to return to the device and change the power source or give it a renewable um, energy supply. If we can harness the power of plants and deploy sensors that can actually siphon off a small amount of energy from a living plant itself, you can imagine the actual opportunity we've got to do some really interesting sensor um, integration. So why closed and why open? I always put this slide up in presentations to try and uh, show the audience that we do have an option. So open source technology, um, especially in conservation tech, has been, I, I believe, really fundamentally important in showing what the community can achieve in the field if we do work together and we do um, bond and share our resources, our capability, and use innovative tools like GitHub and um, source versioning to say, you can share my code, you can access what I've done, and share alike licensing, GPL licensing is, is, has really brought, brought that sense to the community that you're not gonna lose your IP. You're gonna benefit through the success that you see other people have used your, your knowledge and your effort to better the world. But why closed? Well, this is a, an issue that I, you probably find yourself. There's a, there's a risk I always find moving to open and people in the conservation technology scene, especially the large organizations, often see that risk as potentially they're buying into something that isn't gonna have the support. There isn't gonna be someone at the end of, the, of a telephone if a device doesn't work. Or for example, if they invest in a device that's owned by the community, 
who do you call to fix a bug? If it's made by a single developer and that developer moves on, who's there to give it the sustainability it needs to continue into the future? And these kind of closed, um, I'd say, concerns often push a lot of um, large organizations into going down the easy route. It's easy to reach out to an, um, a smaller party or a commercial operator and say, I'm going to buy your device and I want a warranty and I want the safety net around that. And that's a real sell. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good for the closed world. And the open world, I think, really need to think about where's that service level provision? And that's something I'm trying to look at at the moment. How can the open, open um, community solve that problem? So let's look at a case study as to why I think open is, uh, is going to be so beneficial. And what better than Antarctica? So uh, a few years ago, I was offered the fantastic opportunity to travel to Antarctica with an organization called Penguin Lifelines. And Penguin Lifelines is run by a chap called Tom Hart. And his objective is to monitor the status of penguin colonies through the deployment of time-lapse camera traps. It's not just the penguins he's looking at. He's looking at the environment around them. So sea ice change at a very granular level. He's looking at the, the sheer weight of a penguin. He's seeing if there's predation on the chicks. And there's some real climate change questions in here too as to the, the temperature rise and the, the loss of chicks due to heat in the summer. If we can have a look at how bad that's getting or how um, rapid that effect is, having a time-lapse camera in front, front of a colony is incredibly valuable because we are using remote sensing technologies now to count penguins from space. And we're looking at a number of um, drone-based deployments to count penguins en masse. Uh, the British Antarctic Survey, for example, are really investing in that space as well. Tom is looking at time-lapse camera traps. And he does this by buying off-the-shelf hunting camera traps that are designed for the, the deer market in the States and Canada um, uh, as one of the, the primary markets. He uses a Reconyx camera, which is a fantastic camera. And I went out there to try and understand the challenges of deploying remote sensing devices in Antarctica. Um, we traveled out on one of the, um, the large commercial vessels. So that's a, a vessel where you can pay to go as a tourist. And we kind of shadow and take a, a cabin together and we go out with our, our kind of conservation mission. You can see the Zodiac boat in the background that's used um, to, to give us access. So Tom and myself access to some of the islands. So we can go and deploy cameras. And of course, um, we, we kind of shadow the tourists on their sightseeing trip to explore the fantastic place that is Antarctica itself. And as I went, I was asking these questions to myself. Could open source hardware and practices be used to craft our own enclosures, for example? It's a, in, you know, it's a very difficult environment to work in. If you're going to create an enclosure that needs to be IP rated, is it worth traveling all that way to Antarctica to, to try and be successful? Or is it better to buy a commercial solution uh, that's pricey, but it just does that job? It's a risk, and it's one that I had to ask myself. Could, could we create enclosures that are going to survive was one of the first questions I asked. And secondly, could open source hardware perform in this harsh environment? And I'm looking at below negative 40 degrees C. Most off-the-shelf electronics, say Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, are, um, are tested down to negative 20 C. Uh, they usually go a lot higher because it's heat they're, they're trying to be resistant against. But 40 is a different example. And in fact, Canada, I found some deployments in Canada are a hell of a lot worse than Antarctica in, in the peninsula. They're looking like, you know, in incredibly difficult environments. And electronics and cameras specifically freeze up, even the connectors to your uh, enclosures as well. So is it worth investing in open solutions if we're going to use... Um, um, electronics that are printed on demand that may not have been through those stringent commercial um, uh, tests and parameters. So it's another question I had to look at. And importantly, would the conservation technology community have the confidence to commit? Would they invest in open solutions that have been made by a number of people and deploy them in, in essentially difficult to get to remote locations, for example, Antarctica, that is costly to get to? Would that commitment be there? So to test this all out, we made something uh, with a commercial organization in Cambridge. And this is it. This is our first prototype using an off-the-shelf milled enclosure. So this is an, an IP-rated enclosure. Inside that case, there's an iridium modem on the left. There's a lithium polymer battery. That's the big blue battery you see up at the top. 
And you can see we've got a little IRA, so we've got a little kind of honeycomb grid of uh, LEDs down at the bottom, and two cameras, one's for daytime and one's for nighttime. The reason being, usually you have an IR cut filter, which is a mechanical uh, screen that pops in front of the lens so you can take photos at night and the day. We wanted to minimize any kind of uh, mechanical moving parts that could freeze up. So we built this essentially as cheap as possible using uh, an XML um, MCU, and it was designed to do one job, take photographs and send them wirelessly via the Iridium network back to us here in London. And it achieved some attention. You may recognize two people in this photo here, but this is Prince William and Prince Charles over at ZSL holding the very camera trap that I took out to Antarctica and strapped to a pole in front of an Adeli uh, penguin colony. And this was fantastic for the work we were doing at the time because at this point in time, this wasn't open. This was still us using new practices, i.e. how could we use open, not open, how could we use off-the-shelf enclosures and easily accessible boards with this desire to start to look at, okay, could we introduce Arduinos, could we introduce um, Raspberry Pis? And yes, we could. So I'm gonna show you a video now. And this video is a video that was produced for, for Google. And this came at the same time as I was over in Antarctica. And it was their Impact Award. And this is how we were selling the tool at the time. This is how we were, we were uh, a part of a competition um, to try and get half a million pounds for our initiative to help wipe out poaching in Africa. And whilst I was out in Antarctica looking at this camera development, we, we made this video as an example of what we thought we could do to stamp out poaching in Africa. I'm gonna play it for you to give you a good example. It's just a short one minute video. A rhino is lost to poachers in Africa every 11 hours. Wildlife crime is a huge global problem. It's the fourth largest illegal trade in the world, worth over seven billion pounds. 25,000 elephants were lost in Africa last year alone. This rapid increase in wildlife crime is having a major impact on local communities. Tourism is providing jobs, it's paying for education. They're desperate to stop people from coming to take their animals. The Zoological Society of London have developed Instant Wild, a tiny camera capable of sending photographs live from the wild by satellite to law enforcers and park rangers so they can spot criminal activity. They can see what the poachers are up to and they can prevent crimes from happening. We're going to have sounds so we can triangulate gunshots so we'll know when the gunshot has gone off so that we can respond immediately. With the Global Impact Award, the Zoological Society of London aims to reduce poaching by 50% in a section of East Africa over the next two years. We want to protect thousands of rhinos and elephants in Africa, and ultimately we want to protect species across the globe, tigers, even pangolins, and we need to wipe out wildlife crime forever. Okay. So that was a video that was produced, and you can see we talk about a tiny camera in that video. That's our kind of future vision of what we were going to get to. And that video was produced whilst I was in the field, testing this hardware and software. And it was a, a real kind of captivating look at how far could we take this technology. And also, if we we're going to get this tiny video and uh, solve the problem, i.e. mass surveillance, we really needed to reduce cost, accessibility, and we needed to, to think about innovations we could take to, to actually deliver that project. And I can happily report that we won the half a million pounds. It was an absolutely fantastic um, moment, the, the day that happened via the public vote. And we used that to advance the system. Uh, and going back to this, this photo here, you can see actually, as a, the trip in Antarctica finished, there's, you can see the actual Iridium um, antenna on the top there. And we were taking time-lapse photos. I came home with three important takeaways. Why open? Well, it was, there were three things important to me. It was gonna be able to reduce cost. We, we could fundamentally see that if we used open source technology and um, a new Arduino boards and uh, open source hardware that we had access to and could get um, in a cost effective manner, we could dramatically reduce the cost of a system compared to commercially um, developing it. And access was really important too. We could get a large number of units. We could get on-demand uh, electrical PCB manufacturing. We could, it, was, it was a thing now. And we could get the cost down by uh, aggregating the need together. So a number of people buying to get the bomb cost down. And it was, it was a thing. We could really do this. And value is value to the end user. 
If I could travel to Antarctica with a system that cost me one tenth of what it used to cost me, but it gives me the same quality of data, that's really critical. And if it hits those real standards, so it's robust, it works well, it doesn't fail over time, and it, you know, the enclosure uh, retains the device inside, we, we had a winner. This is what it kind of looked like at the time. This is a, a Peli case here with a lot, very large um, battery inside. That's just a, a normal gel cell battery. And here's the, uh, the penguin, in, penguin colony in question. So you can see how close you were to deploying. Here's our setup. So very kind of, you know, string ad hoc. There's, there's a rule in Antarctica where you can't take any man-made substances in and start cementing and gluing your uh, infrastructure in place, which is a fantastic rule to have. So we actually use a chicken wire mesh net and rocks that we find locally on site to just weight the, the actual pole down. It means you can go and deploy the equipment, remove it, and there's, there's no substance left. You're taking away all those physical objects that you brought in. And here's a little screen of the two cameras there, the ones that uh, Prince William and Charles were, were holding in Antarctica doing their job. And they were sending photos back via the Iridium satellite network. So yes, it's possible. I left that uh, fantastic uh, realm on our planet. And if any of you ever get a chance to go, if, if you've been, you'll, you'll know how fantastic it is. But I came back with this feeling that we, we used some off the shelf enclosures and um, new electronics. And if we moved into this open space, we could really produce a fantastic device. And of course, technology has been in Antarctica. These are some radios I found whilst out there at the, the old post office. And um, some fantastic takeaways of some Cadbury's drinking chocolate that I took a photo of. I don't know how fresh that is, but um, <laughs> amazing is to see these, uh, these expeditions of the past and us traveling with these uh, new ways of uh, monitoring the planet and uh, really, really fascinating to see. So moving on back to that fantastic Google win and a second case study, anti-poaching and surveillance in Africa. We've proven now that we could develop our own camera trap system, but we need to ruggedize it and produce something uh, for the mass market. So we made this, this is instant detect. So the legacy system, the Antarctic systems on the left and the production system milled into an aluminum cases on the right. And again, this still isn't open at this point in time. This was about getting a device out to solve a problem. And it was a fantastic way for us to get a really uh, ruggedized system in the field, so made to military spec, and, and get that out to, to start answering questions as to can we actually produce a system that can be used by a, a human being, so rangers with a really nice interface. Can it be, live up to the robustness of life in Africa, so the sheer heat, getting knocked around on the back of vehicles. And we got a number of these systems out into the field through that Google grant. And essentially it's a multi-sensor alarm system for protected areas, but not just a multi-sensor alarm system, but a sensing system. So in terms of a sensing system and in terms of answering questions, both uh, related to habitat change, climate change, uh, the use of uh, land. So habitat change in terms of charcoal, uh, loss at the fringe of parks is a, is a real uh, important use of a system. Uh, we started to look at how we could expand this into the big picture. And that included the three ultimate questions, long range IoT networks, low power and low cost, the three takeaways of the holy grail that everyone's trying to achieve. How can you maximize that range because we're looking at vast uh, remote spaces? How can you produce a low power system? So minimal maintenance that runs for you know, 12 months as a minimum. And of course, cost. If you're going to try and sense a large area and really get a good data set, you can't afford um, to buy a system if every single sensor is astronomically expensive. So how could this be achieved through adopting open principles, software and hardware practices? How can we take an expensive sensor and use open principles to make a hell of a lot more of them at a cost to achieve those free values. And this was just going around in my head and head constantly. And with a mission statement like this, this is the ZSL instant tech mission statement, secure 100 priority sites by 2019, time is of the essence. And the reason these sites need to be secured is because each one has a species that is found locally that's either critically endangered or heavily poached. And you can see here, we're looking at rhinos, tigers, elephants, pangolins four species that are in dire need of some real both surveillance and protection and 100 priority sites secured by 2019 would be fantastic. And now I was getting into realms of, okay, 
I see open as a, as a future. I'm thinking modular, customizable, and accessible as a need. So think about your phone. There are many components in there. You can see in the photo here. If you strip them down into what you're looking at, you've got the, the, the sheer essence of a mobile device. You've got a, a small power supply. You've got often a wireless, small um, microprocessing system. You've got an interface, i.e. a screen. And you've got a device that needs to be made uh, scale, so a lot of people can use it. And here's where the Shuttleworth Foundation came in. So I'm a Shuttleworth Fellow right now, and I've created an initiative called the Arabada Initiative. And there's one job I want to do, which is to systematically target and open the technologies that offer the most value and have the greatest impact if made accessible and available for all. And essentially, my time in Antarctica, learning how to deploy the system and um, co-designing and building these uh, new cameras got me to this point, this kind of open future. I could see that if we weren't going to adopt a, an open methodology and I wasn't going to move into um, uh, using open practices, I wasn't going to achieve conservation success in the field. And this led me to um, get really heavily involved in a program called SMART. And for park management, I think this is a fantastic tool for me to spend uh, 10 minutes on now to share share with you a prime example of what the conservation community can do, and these are the big organizations, if they adopt open software and open hardware. So what is SMART? SMART is the Spatial Monitoring and Reporting Tool. And you may or may not have heard of it, but it's a tool for measuring and evaluating and improving the effectiveness of wildlife law enforcement patrols and site-based conservation activities. So essentially, it's a tool that is primarily used for law enforcement, but also can be used for land management, habitat change. You can use it to, to essentially even manage ingress into a park. So who's coming into a park, who's coming out. It's a very diverse tool and it's a reporting tool at its heart, designed to show governments and decision makers what's going on in large protected areas. And it's a partnership, so it's not just one entity. Uh, this is a slightly old screen, actually, so if there's even more partners now, but you can see some big names in there. So WCS, WWF, ZSL, Pantheras, CITES, uh, North Carolina Zoo, Peace Parks, Frankfurt Zoological Society. And these organizations came together to develop, and here's, here's the takeaway, an open source tool. And that's why I originally got involved heavily in SMART, because this tool at its heart was designed as an open tool. I knew fundamentally I was going to be able to work with it in a way I wanted to, i.e. I could develop new software, I could work with the partners knowing that we're all going to share alike and pass on our, our, um, our efforts. And if I was going to work on an open source um, sensing platform that I could fundamentally fit into an open source tool because I'm able to work in, in both elements, the hardware world and the software world. So I loved the fact when SMART was, uh, was uh, initialized and I jumped right in and became a part of the technical council. And I actually lead the, the security council now in SMART to look at how we're going to secure um, both the IoT sensors that flood in and the use of the, of the desktop tool. But essentially, it was developed to um, maintain, uh, the, the partnership was developed to maintain the functionality of the software, develop protection standards, and as a partner outreach and coordination tool. So it looks like this. This is the, the hierarchy. There's a user council at the top. They look at standards, the intelligence, um, training, and planning. So they're the guys in the field using the tool that can feed back to the, the, the larger structure uh, as a whole and to, to the board and the steering committee. Then there's a technology council. And they sit behind the scenes, so I'm a part of the technology council. That looks like it that looks at product management, testing, um, it uh, develops the software as a whole, so the user's feedback as to what they want to change in the software, um, new features, bugs, issues, what they would like to see it do in the, in the, in the near uh, future. And we look at those requirements and try and ensure that uh, that's, uh, it's, it's uh, implemented into the software as a whole. And of course, importantly, a fundraising and marketing council. So you can see there, it's always fundamental to have a core, um, a core uh, asset, um, a budget you can rely on to keep the lights on. And each uh, member in SMART um, pays a small contribution annually to make sure that that happens. And of course, there's private investment and foundations that help the, the tool succeed and go on and do, do new things and grow. 
and of course a steering committee that looks at the, the whole um, architecture. So key benefits, Smart is free, which is fantastic. It's a free tool, you can download it right now and it's an open source uh, resource for the conservation community, which means that you can participate in the source code and the development of the tool and it, it's got at its heart that fundamental um, accessible uh, and future-proof um, heart that I really love from the start and why I've been so um, uh, involved in its, in its progress. And of course, it's standardized. And standardized, as you, as you all well know, is really important. If you want to prove uh, that climate change, for example, is um, having an adverse effect in one area, but your data sets are different or your sensor hardware is different, you need to calibrate, you need to standardize. And this tool tries to do that for conservation uh, tech. Uh, intelligence is fully integrated into protection activities, uh, planning, comprehensive planning and evaluation functions are available. Uh, it's a very powerful analysis and reporting engine, and it's adaptable to local contexts and languages, which I think is really important. To have a software tool that can be um, easily um, translated opens up doors, because if you take a tool into um, a country that is trying to use the tool purely on the basis that only one person understands it without getting a local context and a language in there and letting the real users like the park rangers understand and use it is it's just slowing your progress down and here's where smart connect comes in and to me smart connect is the future of how we're going to work together as a community and i'm going to just go through how this works now because it may be useful for you as a viewer to have a look at what smart connects doing and think about how IoT networks that we're taking from smart cities. So a fantastic presentation recently about the sensor up. How can we incorporate that into the conservation realm? So all that great advancement in many, many sensors sending small packets of data and alerts and, um, and um, important um, events. How can we use that to better what we do in the field? And this is where Smart Connect comes in. So Smart essentially was a disconnected desktop. It was designed primarily at the beginning to run on a laptop with no internet connection. That's life in rural protected areas. There is no T-free internet line. Maybe you've got VSATs and satellite internet at best or very poor GSM. It's designed as a disconnected desktop. But if you do have GSM or you do have uh, access to the internet, then Smart Connect can fundamentally improve your effectiveness. So data acquisition, how does it work? Well, there's a software and hardware angle. So in the field, uh, Open Data Kit is used on phones and PDAs along with Cyber Tracker by the rangers to collect data. So that's photographs or uh, GPS locations of where they may have seen a poaching event, where they've apprehended uh, someone carrying um, some snares, for example. And of course, you've got a little bit of hardware in there. So radios and GPS tracking devices may be used um, as well. So this is all collected locally and fed into this desktop tool. Then you've got the consumer tools. So local people with mobile phones, they may be able to record or, or SMS in events they've seen to the rangers. Uh, smartphones, of course, can be used for data logging. So the community, scouts and informants, they also feed into this desktop tool locally in the field. And sensors, this is where instant detect comes in. Camera traps, GPS-based tracking systems, ground sensors and UAVs, all those really... Uh, important useful tools at the moment that data is is basically saved in the field or to a, um, a central hub and it's fed into a desktop tool which doesn't really make sense let's look at how smart desktop can leverage for example the Amazon cloud and turn into a connected online device so here's the layer right at the top smart connect now what you're looking at is a connected tool with a centralized database, headquarters staff can report, and it means that all of that data entry that floods into the desktop can now flow automatically into a greater system. So we can start to compare, because of course it's standardized, we can compare effort, we can look at how a range of patrol that's been modified and been much more successful could, uh, could be analyzed with a, an adjacent park. We can look at that in the cloud and run some real deep analysis on that. We can get those camera trap photos up into the cloud and start to look at, can we see, for example, even a poacher walking from one park to the next to the next, you can physically track that presence if you want to by using smart connected devices. And I see the future of open 
fundamentally meaning that this system on the screen, this screenshot, can exist and go into the future. It can be a, it can be not just a tool, but a community of users inventing new ways of delivering sensor technology in the field via hardware, working in the cloud on software packages, add-ons, and plugins. And if we share access to both of these worlds, we can essentially do this. And this is the smart partnership as it look, looks today. And there's a hell of a lot of sites. You can see the Philippines have massively adopted smart as a tool. And this is fantastic to see. This is over the, the past three to five years. And just to see the take up of smart as a tool, so every single um, icon here is a protected area manager using uh, smart with patrols and law enforcement efforts. And we're looking at 389 sites, 46 countries, 10 governments, um, and that's you know rising all the time. And what I think is, was fundamental to this is because it was freely available, it was an open tool, it had that really important um, large NGO base behind it, which took away that risk because people knew if they used smart, they could fall back on their own staff, i.e. staff in-house from WCS, WWF, ZSL. You remember at the beginning of my presentation, that's always a risk with people. It had those takeaways. It had what it needed to do to be successful. And as I've continued on my journey into why open conservation technology has been so fundamental to me, I think that's a shining example of what you can do if you do produce a tool and just think if that tool had been closed and commercial and expensive to get access to and I couldn't have worked in it, I'd fundamentally know it's going to be difficult for me to integrate my sensors. It may include a hell of a lot of paperwork. It may be uh, a long haul. I may, it may, I may even get to the end and have a legal disagreement where I can't actually connect to the system. By using open principles, we can produce things like SMART together. And for climate change and mass, uh, the mass observation of our planet and monitoring, I really hope uh, that we, it's a shining example of what you can do uh, and in your protected areas and parks in Canada to, um, to work with open source technologies. And I think I'll uh, end my, uh, my presentation there. Well, that was wonderful, Alistair. Uh, so folks, uh, the, the Q&A function is where you can pose questions. I'll, uh, monitor those, but uh, as we wait for some questions to come in, Alistair, uh, uh, the, the the three presentations this week, really, you know, with Dr. Stephen Liang from the University of Calgary and the, the CEO of the startup, uh, SensorUp, uh, which is part of the Eclipse Foundation, and then at 11 o'clock, uh, Tracy Miranda of the Eclipse Foundation, uh, chair of the Science Working Group, and what you've just mentioned, I think there's lots of potential for collaboration between all three sort of streams. And, uh, you know, like I mentioned, uh, whether it's a uh, grizzly bear monitoring in Kananaskis country or elsewhere, uh, you know, that we could collaborate with the University of Calgary, for example, with Steve. Mm -hmm. You know, I just see tons and tons of op collaborative opportunities uh, to do exactly, ho hopefully, help help you achieve your dream in terms of sort of this open source uh, conservation technology uh, philosophy. Yeah, definitely. And you'll see that um, the innovation in IoT technology is often um, from smart cities, as they're called. So the investment at the moment is is in that space. the The use of IoT in the field is often because the companies have founded some really good um, sensor networks. So, for example, um, LoRa as a as a principal, the long range radio network, that has a really good footprint now. If you look at the global penetration of where it's being used, and LoRa One, for example, allows you to connect devices. So it's a wide area network protocol, meaning that if someone invests in hardware or software devices in a city to let's say uh, monitor 2000 buses going about their daily business and who's getting on, who's getting off. The same tech can be used on a rhino to monitor 2000 rhinos walking around. And I think if we, if we adopt this principle that we can work together in these, in these innovative ways and we allow each other to work together, i.e. we have open APIs and application programming interfaces that are well documented and we say, hey, if you have access to a technology 
or you have invented a new super low powered low energy Bluetooth sensor that, that does something new that potentially that a species may need. So to, to tag a, a, you know, a species like the Mataki device, let's work together. It's, it, I just think there's a, there's a real win there if we can, um, we can share both worlds and you know, open is a, is a way to do that. Well, when I got to Sri Ala Prolu, who is the global lead for uh, Internet of Things for Amazon AWS uh, public sector to present, the reason I got him to present was I had found that the city of Chicago, London, and Singapore had used Amazon AWS to share tr transit data. So the whole mm -hmm. point was they could securely share data and actually um, empower or create opportunities for local programmers by sharing that data, but the data was never exposed in an insecure way. If it, like it, it was shared in a way that was secure and it was always kind of like a read only if that's the old philosophy of you can't change the data, right? Yeah. So I think there's tons of opportunities to you know, this combination of open source and cloud technology, which is kind of like the new way of doing things. Exactly, yeah. And it's, it's a good question you raised then about that um, access to data because one thing I've, I've found too is with the, uh, with the advent of accessibility to certain um, new affordable technologies, so let's just say, um, again, uh, it's easy to get a low energy Bluetooth device now that's, you know, a few pounds, a few dollars, a small footprint, you put a battery on and you can put a GPS breakout on there and collect some data. Now, if you were a hobbyist or an enthusiast who, you know, wants to go and do something uh, to better the planet and says, hey, I'm going to go and use that in my own back garden to go and uh, tag uh, mountain lions over in, uh, in California. Um, if you go and do that, but you do it in a way where you are not looking at the best security protocols or you're exposing that data so anyone else who wants to listen in on the wireless data you're collecting can do there's a question there around yes we can proceed together we can use open technologies but we do need some standards and in fact i hosted an event over at, um uh london zoo a few weeks ago um for 50 to 60 iot developers to create an open iot kite mark um, and I think it's a fantastic idea. So it's not actually my idea, but I'm supporting because I think it's brilliant. But a kite mark that says, if you do want to work in this space, we'll have some standards that are community, that, you know, led by a community, and you can adhere to that kite mark. You can say, okay, I'll have a look at that. Um, I will submit my idea, my design, my, um, my architecture, and have the community say, yep, yeah, there's, there's an issue here, but we can help you solve it. Not just there's an issue, you know, you're not invited into this world. It's like, we'll help you solve it go away, change this, have a look at this, talk to this chap here. And, you know, we can develop devices that are secure, that do offer the ability to collect data in, in, a, in a private and well-monitored way, which is very important for, as you can imagine, tracking animals. And um, again, it's great to see the, the IoT sector uh, get together and say, hey, this should be a thing. Like, why isn't it? Let's, let's move forward. And the whole Eclipse movement too is, is brilliant to see. You know, we, we can work together um, what the future holds is, is fascinating to me. Well, and, and uh, at least uh, reflecting on the map that you showed us, Alistair, uh, I, I don't think there was very many uh, North American locations on that map. Yeah. So maybe we, we should get, be able to get some Alberta locations. Yeah, for sure. And again, the tool, okay, it's primarily for um, you know, uh, law enforcement, but there are smart users that use it purely just to manage um, habitat use over time or even um, repairing fences. You know, if you do your patrols, it's a patrol tool at its heart. So if you want to go out there and check that you haven't got any um, fences down or animal damage or any, you know, any aspect of land management, it, it does its job well. And of course, it's free. You can go and check it and try it out yourself. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously selling it now because I think it's a great tool. <laughs> Um, there are many more out there, but um, just take a look. It may be of benefit to you because um, there's been a lot of um, thought and process and development put in there and a lot of blood and sweat to, to try and make it a tool that can, um, can help you do your job more effectively. 
Well, I know in Alberta that we're lots of the, you know, our conservation agencies are using, you know, the, the wildlife cams. But uh, yeah. my understanding is you still have to go out there and collect the cards, the memory cards, to get the images. And this whole low, LoRa standard and what you guys are doing seems to me that it's completely different kind of premise, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you essentially have to shrink those photos down. So Laura, um, at its heart, is designed for small packets of data. So you can't send those high-res photos. You have to shrink them down into very small thumbnails. But what it can do is it can show you what's happening in that photo in a small thumbnail. So you can make a decision if you want to go out and attend that camera. So if you're looking for a particular species or you're looking for essentially a human walking past. And you can imagine once you've got these photos at a central processing unit in the field and you use image recognition, well, then you're off because then you can say, okay, tell me what's in the photo. If you, if you can run an algorithm, make a decision that there's a 50% confidence level, that there isn't a human or there is, you can just send those photos over a satellite link to really save you on bandwidth and cost um, and then make some really informed decisions. And that's what the community is asking for at the moment. They're asking for that really low maintenance intelligent system that can operate at range at an affordable cost that they can they can leave as a standalone deploy and forget um, uh, installation and um, that's what we're working to to create at the, at the moment and my um, my shuttleworth foundation work is all about accessibility and access to that world through open source technologies Oh, this has been a fantastic presentation, Alistair. That's it's great. And uh, so just uh, for the folks that are uh, listening, looks like we've got to uh, just open this up. How might you compare the use of smart versus or in conjunction with data sharing and management programs such as eMammal? Definitely. So I think that's Roland Key's world. He's a really uh, fantastic camera trapping expert. Yeah, I would say... Smart at the moment, because it was a desktop tool primarily, has just ventured into this smart connect universe. So that's the, the space that I've been kind of working in to as to, you know, progressing that so we've got access to the data. Uh, tools like eMammal um, and tools that also support community-based camera trap aggregation. So people sending in their photos so we can assess uh, wildlife in, in the back garden. So uh, I've, I've got a co-founder co of a startup called Nature Bites 2 that does that. You can get access to uh, build your own cameras. I think the, the, the real future there is in the cloud because if smart can be trained by the data that eMammal acquires, so for example, if eMammal has 2 million photos of a particular species and there's an algorithm run on it, so that could be a hell of a lot of people providing access to even like their photography, and you can then train an algorithm to get better and better at detecting what's in that photo. You could then use that in camera traps in the field, so smart camera traps, um, to tell the system, for example, is there a person or not in this? Is there a deer or not in this photo? Which makes it a more potent tool. It means that rangers can then um, only react to events that they definitely need to react to because false alerts can drive people insane when you have to travel an hour and a half to go and check a sensor that tells you that something's happened and then you find out that it's just a false alert. So I think the, the kind of conjunction with data sharing and management programs is all in the cloud because smart users are fundamentally operating in remote spaces and to logistically have a, have a, you know, a think about how we can, we can share and use the two of them would be difficult. Get it in the cloud and we can, we can really have a, a tool that I think we can play with. Well, I think there's three fundamental choices in terms of the cloud. There's Microsoft Azure, and mm. there's the Google Cloud, and there's Amazon AWS. And I know that both Google and Amazon are are all over this whole integration of uh, AI with, you know, their cloud services. So exactly, yeah. What you just mentioned in terms of image recognition. In fact, that's what Amazon calls their service is recognition. Yeah, exactly. And you can imagine that as a, as a filter between the two worlds. So you, you have smart and you expose uh, access to some of the, the data, which isn't private. 
so you can uh, advance the system. You've got eMammal, which is throwing the, the photos up into cloud, and then the big players like Google with their um, image recognition system, systems and Amazon do that filtration for you. So like TensorFlow, for example, if that's well-trained, I've seen it be incredibly effective. They're putting all the effort and their own uh, skin in the game into making their tool, their image recognition algorithms, as good as they can be, that we can actively use. So essentially, our niche is collecting those photos and getting it to the people in the field, um, getting the, the intelligence to the people in the field so they can do their job better. So you can you can see it happening now, can't you, as to the, the opportunity that's out there. So, so where, where did the inspiration for doing this? Because, I mean, it's, it's like a real maker philosophy. You just kind of saw a need and, you know, how in the heck did you get contacts at Google and Sh the Shuttleworth Foundation, Alistair? Yeah. So essentially, I've, I've always been, I'd say, I've been a maker at heart. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation um, um, and Mozilla. So Mozilla have something called um, MozFest, which is like their festival where you can get together and kind of uh, hack and make and make the web a better, better, better space. I spent a lot of time in that world um, in the early days whilst I was working at um, ZSL. And you could see with the advent of, for example, the camera module for the Raspberry Pi and the advent of cheap wireless um, USB dongles and so on for some of these um, desktop-based kind of uh, microprocessors and tools, that, that, that world could be tuned and used in a successful way for conservation um, and law enforcement if you put the tools into the hands of the right people. So through my job at uh, ZSL, as we started to have questions come in from conservationists in the field as to can they transmit photos back wirelessly from camera traps? Can they um, do simple things like assess if a gate was opened or closed and get that data back to their smartphone? Um, they're technical questions and often the, the field conservationists are biologists and they're trained to work in uh, stats and use programs such as R and um, Python to look at um, analyzing data. That's their kind of technical world. They don't really get into electrical engineering and wireless communications. So there was a need and I kind of started to look at can I address that need? Um, it's grown a lot since I started. There's a, there's a real movement now. Um, and, and again, the whole IoT world getting in on um, developing uh, smarter, you know, better tags for animals is a, is a, is a big win. But I think that need um, fueled my desire to, to reach out and start talking about what I did. Um, I then started networking with some big players in the open source space, found out about the Shutterworth Foundation, um, that was essentially uh, the, a perfect opportunity for me to say, I believe in the foundation's ethos. Here's what I want to do. And I pitched my idea saying, you know, is this, is this compatible with your thinking? And they said, yes, it is. Let's work together. And I got the fellowship, which gives me the freedom now to concentrate on what's next, like really solving problems. Um, so that's how it kind of happened. And I would say there are, there are a lot of great engineers out there that probably haven't yet realized that they can um, use their skills and know-how in conservation, in um, the natural world. Um, I'd love to try and entice a few of them into uh, more of our, our community, um, potentially even get them talking on similar Zoom presentations as to how they think they could play their part. But um, there's, there's, I think there's a long way to go in building that world. There's, there's techies that are sort of hacking and making stuff, and there's the kind of conservation technologists. I think we could get a few more of those techies into the conservation technologist realm and do a lot more if we if we uh, concentrate on that. So, Alistair, uh, if any of our uh, participants wanted to kind of uh, scheme ahead with some collaboration with you uh, and your organization, how would they go about approaching you? Yeah, I mean, just... Uh, Get in touch on Twitter if you want, um, or you can find me on the Shuttleworth Foundation page. So uh, just Google Shuttleworth Foundation. There's a big photo of me in, in Antarctica with the <laughs> camera trap system. But by all means, please do get involved because um, I think there's a real um, opportunity for us to, to work together. And I'm, I'm specifically spending my year as a fellow uh, trying to crack this challenge. 
Yeah, well, there's a, a question posed here. It has been challenging to get our own agencies and teams to get on board with even using data sharing programs, as is obvious from the lack of presence in North America for the smart map. What might be a key selling point from your perspective to present busy managers and conservationists here in Alberta and North America? Yeah, a really good point. And it's, it's funny, isn't it? That map really does show that as well. Um, I would say in the same way as I, as I presented case studies, I think they need to see that using, um, well, for, for example, they need to see that by using data sharing programs, they don't just get a better output, but they can save costs. They can look at how a reduction in their overall budget could be piped into keeping jobs in the field. They need to see those kind of like desk-based takeaways that are often hidden behind someone getting an email saying, hey, share your data. Because data sharing can be a scary process. Um, you can see too that in, in the data sharing world, if there's one aspect of that space that I feel large organizations fear, it is also the, the security of that data. So for example, if you were sharing your data to um, a community that was then using it in the cloud and there was a compromise on the system and you found out that some very private data um, was leaked, Issues such as that we know happen all the time now with all of the, the ransomware that's going around and um, this uh, this critical need to really secure systems, but it puts big organizations off sharing their data. And it really is um, an aspect I think we need to crack by saying that it is safe and it is advantageous for you to do, but we have to present some real case studies and say that the big parks out there like Africa Parks and Peace Parks Foundation that are managing hundreds of thousands of uh, hectares of land and huge teams are winning in the space that they're getting good reports, they're getting um, access to information and data by sharing it, that is helping them be more effective in the field. Um, mm -hmm. If we can get better at doing that, I think we're gonna be get better at saying to uh, conservationists in Alberta and North America that you, you can invest in this and you can use it too. Well, when I, I just make a quick comment with uh, when I had a speaker from the Alaska Telehealth Consortium, which provides telehealth to all remote indigenous communities mm -hmm. uh, within Alaska. One of the things that they had developed, which is similar to your philosophy, was they had a citizen science smartphone app where people could just use their smartphone and capture images with the GPS coordinates built in and upload those uh, to contribute, like, here's what I've observed here. Is this normal? What's going on? Is this, this species where it should be? So I, I really like your mention of kind of a combination of, uh, I guess I would say, professional biologists with citizen science. Yeah. Like, yeah, definitely. Yeah, the citizen, citizen science um, is you know, a thriving uh, metropolis of opportunity as well, because uh, I like the fact that as citizens, to re remember that, that key word, you're, we're inviting people that want to participate in conservation action, but they, they can't due to their physicality, they're in a city, they uh, are you know, busy in their life, and if we can help them answer questions in the field and get them connected to the, the conservation of our planet, essentially, that's a great thing. And using technology to do that is uh, fundamentally important. And, and just to, to finish quickly, the, one of the reasons um, I started looking at um, sending photos through satellite in the first place was there's an, an app called Instant Wild, and it was using uh, cellular camera traps to send photos um, to users to identify in real time. And it was, again, something I, I made as a development tool, purely as an experiment um, at, at ZSL. And it today is now getting a, a new um, remake into Android and, uh, and so on because it's, it's been a, a really successful tool in gluing people to uh, the work we do in the field. Um, and the reason it does that is because it's emotionally captivating. It's, it's looking at the presence of um, elephant families walk past and um, the same leopard visiting a spot uh, each night. And you become connected to these wild animals through 
simply sending a photo to your device. But the, of course, the photo has to be in real time. If the photo was taken six years ago, it's just an archive I'm looking at. Yeah. You know it was two minutes ago and you're sitting there having your tea or you're on your commute. Uh, it's a rainy day. You know, you're, 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 you've had a tough time in the office all week long. You suddenly see a baby rhino looking back at you. <laughs> this uh, is a fantastic <laughs> <That's okay>. experience. <laughs> and, um, you know, by, by getting that kind of huge crowd involved, I think it just... It also rings a bell in terms of how people vote, how people think about environmental issues locally. These people then grow, um, teenagers as well, they grow into these uh, managers that sit and you know monitor and uh, work in our parks, the future parks. And uh, I think why not use this in science as a perfect tool to both help conservation in the field, but just get more people involved in, in contributing and learning about uh, how they can uh, can help us be successful. Well, this has been a wonderful presentation, and uh, no just problem. for for everyone, uh, just know that uh, it will be posted probably within two days to YouTube, our our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find it by searching for MCCAC. And Alistair, thanks so much for doing this fantastic presentation. No problem, uh, a pleasure. And um, any questions, just get in touch. Um, and I'd be, be you know, happy to help because it's, uh, it's, it's just been a pleasure to also talk to you today and uh, you know, keep up all the good work. Absolutely. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye now.